Every year in mid-September, some of the most powerful African-American business, corporate, community, and political leaders meet here in our nation's capital. It's called the Congressional Black Caucus Legislative Conference. But the real nuts and bolts, the real problem solving and brain trust take place right here in this facility, the Washington Convention Center. This year's conference was the 24th annual conference and drew over 30,000 participants from across the U.S. and abroad. The conference itself is sponsored by the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, a nonprofit research-oriented offshoot of the CBC. The Congressional Black Caucus was formed in 1970 when 13 black representatives joined together to strengthen their efforts to address the legislative concerns of black and minority citizens. Since then, the CBC ranks have increased to 41 members made up of 11 women, 30 men, 39 of which are Democrat, one U.S. Senator, Carol Mosley Braun, and two non-voting delegates. Congressman Donald Payne in New Jersey was recently elected chair, replacing the charismatic Kwasi and Fume of Maryland. CBC members sponsored a total of 506 bills and co-sponsored over 2,000 pieces of legislation during last year's session. This year's conference theme was Embracing Our Youth for a New Tomorrow, with many of the issues forums and brain trust focusing on problems and solutions relating to our African-American youth. There were 65 brain trust and issue forums that took place over a five-day period, ranging from education to housing, civil rights, women, aging, foreign affairs, environmental concerns, banking, religion, and health care, among others. And April, One such forum to took place on the second day of the conference, a national town meeting entitled chilling Generation X, and I Black Voices of Reason, exactly Rage, and Responsibility. Most black households are not doing better than ever before. In fact, if you look at the statistics, you'll see that we're about on par the way we were percentage-wise in 1960. It's not a big difference. There are a few people who have made it. Some have nice houses, and we don't uh, regret that. And some have an opportunity, and we welcome that, the fact that others are able to get education. But the masses of people today are still where the masses of people were 35 years ago. And the movement for equality and expansion is a movement that is still directed at the government because it is the government that taxes. If you didn't have to pay tax, then you could sit back and say, we don't expect the government to do anything. But because you do, I think you have a right and responsibility, all of us, to expect not that the government is going to solve our problems, because it never has and it never will, but that it will be a bridge over troubled water, a way, if you will, to get people into college, to make sure that we have expansion in our society, and understanding that jobs is still the best social program, and a sort of willingness as a government to understand that we are diverse, and we ought to be flexible as a nation. We don't all think alike, look alike, and we won't all act alike. Well, I would agree with the congressman with most of what he said. Uh, I would say, though, that the disparity between the haves and the have-nots has definitely increased, and that is utilized against us very much because the haves have stuff, so they don't say nothing about the have-nots. Um, the reality is, is that what has to happen nowadays, it's, it's time for black Americans to get real and understand that a lot of us that are in positions and have nice jobs and things like that are there simply because of the work of the civil rights movement. And we can't continue on the same civil rights agenda. The reality on this, hold one second. The reality on this though is that it is up to the people that got these fancy educations and went to these good schools and things like that, the black folks, to really r change the agenda. We, we talked at the beginning that we didn't have a direction. We, the agenda right now needs to be about economics. You know, we had a civil rights movement, the Generation X people, that what our movement needs to be, that we need to make our own, it needs to be an eco economics rights movement, because that is the source of true empowerment. Let the reason that we have a lot of problems in the black community now is because there aren't that many role models. The role models are drug dealers, the role models are athletes, and that's what you see. And if you're an athlete or if you're a drug dealer, you might get respect, you might get love from your, from your peers, but if you're somebody trying to do something day in and day out, there is no love, and there's no love because there aren't any dreams right now in the community, is the way I see it. And the only way you're going to have dreams, if you see some way you can get your dreams, you can make them a reality. And if all you see is drugs on the corner, crack vials in front of your house, you know, people peeing on the corner, the schools are bad, what type of dreams are you going to have? You're not going to have any. What you're going to do is you're going to live in a nightmare, and it should be no surprise that that's what's going on today. Uh, the public education system in many of our inner cities is, t is really failing our children. And so I think we, as, as black people, need to think about coming together and, start, and starting our own schools, and we have our own rules, 
And if we want to educate only black males, we can do that without the ACLU saying that we can't do it. By far the most outspoken and provocative panelist was syndicated talk show host Montel Williams. The problem with America's youth today, especially black America's youth, is America's adults and black America's adults. I got to tell you, I no longer, I, I agree. That's why we have the congressmen, we have people working to change the laws and pass the bills and get us the help and support that we need on high. But I'm going to tell you something, unless we start getting the support on low, unless one young black man will look in the face of his brother and say, I'm not going to hurt you, kill you, spit at you, shoot you, we're never going to win this. And we need other men, black men, black women, to step into the community and say, I'm willing to come here not to be your role model, because these kids don't need role models. I've been against this term since the term started. All of a sudden in America, when black young men have a problem, somebody says, and whoever identifies with this role model is going to be, we say this person's got to be the role model. You go emulate him and everything will be okay. I will tell you what they need to do is just an understanding of being able to look into a mirror. You look into a mirror and you say to yourself, what do I want to be 10 years from now, 15 years from now? And then you find an adult like yourself, like me, one of these people up here in this panel that can help you get there. We have to start remembering that we have to help each other by reaching back and sticking out a hand. And that's what's been forgotten. Adults in America are willing very quickly to blame these young men and women for shooting each other. But I'm going to tell you something. They do not bear the blame of making the guns. I have not seen one young man in America that's black, Hispanic, or Asian, or poor get busted for creating you know, M10s and you name the weapon, uh, the 9mm, you name the weapons that are out there. I've not seen one young man get busted for that. I've not seen one young man in this country get busted for flying an airplane in there from Colombia, Peru. I saw something in the newspaper a couple weeks ago about submarines. I'm going to stop for you. About submarines being used now to bring drugs into America. These kids are not creating these submarines. These kids are the people that are being used by these adults out there. If we as adults get together and do what we're supposed to do, and that is protect our children, we could turn this around. We can no longer afford uh, the misnomer that parents are responsible. I think they're ultimately responsible. But when a parent fails, there has to be a net to catch that child. And we haven't provided the net. And so I think it's all of our responsibility because when I was growing up, if, if my mother failed me, we know the story. You got a whooping by everybody in the neighborhood and then you got some, some other stuff when you got to church. And so we all have a responsibility in, in reclaiming our young people. But most importantly, we have a responsibility to go back to the great commandment to love God with all our heart and mind and soul and to love neighbor and self. First thing uh, was a quote that my father uh, had, which was, uh, unless you found something worth dying for, you're not fit to live. And that's what Ken is really talking about. Until we overcome that fear of death, some of us will not even begin to address some of these problems that are facing our young people. The other thing I was going to say to the sister here, um, probably a challenge to college students. A lot of our college students should really be tapping into systems uh, educational systems that surround their communities, elementary schools, high schools, et cetera, uh, because a lot of college students are going to school and that's it. And we need to begin, when you talk about intergenerational touch, not just the adults, but those between 18 and 21 can sit down and, and read a book with a child. They can tutor children in areas that they are having problems. They can begin to become that inspiration for that child or that young person to want to go to college and even help them in terms of the steps that they need to take. And so let's not just look to those that are over 30, but let's also hold responsible, again, the generation or the people that have been blessed with these opportunities to the generation that's right behind them or the young people right behind them. One thing I'd like to say right now, especially with all these young brothers and sisters out there in the audience, what we need to do today is put them guns down. We need to quit hurting each other. But until, until we quit concerning ourselves with man's laws and start taking some of God's laws into hand, That's right. this thing isn't going to get better. Um, I see that we want to go all over the world and take care of some problems. We need to invade some of these inner cities and get rid of these guns and get rid of some of this drug action that's happening here. And I bet you if there was a Congressional Black Caucus 200 years ago talking about issues dealing with the black male, we'd all be saying the government's going to do something about it. 
They are not going to do something about it. They're going to pass bills to build more prisons. We understand that now. They are going to pass bills to get more cops on the street, to lock more and more of us up. The bottom line is the only way we can stop us from being locked up is if we stop us from conducting the behavior that would get us locked up to begin with. And the only way we can do that is through a lot of things that we do image-wise. And I'm sorry, I've got to tell you something. I've asked each member of jump, man on the, every young man on this panel to wear a certain little thing. And they have a little pin on and Most people out here across the country will see a little glow on my chest, and it's called a three-quarter pin. But the first thing we need to do is to stop acknowledging only those that do so wrong in this country. We have, in the last five years, every time we hear somebody des describe the plight of the black male in America, they talk about one in four black ma men are dead or in jail. One in four black men are doing this wrong. One in four black men are having babies and not taking care of them. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I'm a father. I take care of my children. All these people up here are out here working in this community trying to do the right job. We are three out of four black men that aren't messing up. If these kids saw this as the example, they would stop going after the people that are so celebrated in the media. Right. Okay. Yeah. Montel, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your, your organization, the Three Quarter Club? Well, I have a nonprofit organization I've had for the last five years. It's called Reach the American Dream. And through Reach the American Dream, what we wanted to do was just send out these pins. It's not really a club. It's just a movement. I'm buying the pins, I'm sending them out. And I'm sending them out, so far I've sent them out to all the Congressional Black Caucus, I've sent it out across the country to, to the uh, Fortune 500 list of all black entrepreneurs. I'm just gonna send them and keep sending them because maybe one day people will start to notice that there are more and more black men with this kind of a pin on and stop only acknowledging the ones that don't have it on. And what does the three quarters signify? Well, the media itself, I, my own industry, one of the things that we have said over and over again in the last five or six years has been one in four black men are in trouble, one in four black men are in jail, one in four black men have done this wrong. There are several of us out there that are doing the right thing all the time. Reverend, what is your message to our young people who may be caught up in, in uh, drugs and crime or leaning in that direction? What should our young people be striving for today? Well, I think the first thing that, that they should never give up hope of is for an education. Um, because when you unlock the doors of ignorance, then you open up a whole new world of possibilities. And particularly in this country, because we value education. And, and the education really is the key um, to getting to the top in this country. So that's, that's one of the messages. The second message that I have to them is primarily don't lose hope. And, and what that means is whatever it is that you desire to do, be or see in, in and around your community, you hold on to that thing because as long as you can envision it, then you can reach for it. It's when you stop envisioning something that that you begin to give up hope and that you become extremely uh, depressed and things of that nature, you start turning in. Uh, and the third thing is I would like to see our young people go back to the church, to be very honest with you. And I'm not talking about necessarily the traditional church, just go up in the church and do but allow what the church represents to get down inside of them. Because when you undergird yourself spiritually, there's nothing on the outside that can overcome you. Okay. Now, your father is one of the greatest men, without question, to ever grace this nation. And I've heard many African-American people say, oh, if we could just have another Martin Luther King, if we could just have another Malcolm X. Are we as a people waiting to be saved by someone with the, the magnetism that your father had? I think on a subconscious level we are, um, but I do think that there are people who are exhibiting uh, what my father exhibited, maybe not on a national level, but in local uh, areas and state areas. And I think that's what's most important. Uh, we don't need to wait for another leader. Uh, we already have enough people with those qualities and those potentials and insight and vision. What, what needs to happen, though, is those people who have the vision be, need to begin to get together. Um, and come up with a systematic plan because, you know, really uh, we're being systematically, strangely enough, destroyed. And if we don't systematically come up with a plan to offset that, then we're going to be in trouble. Do you value uh, open discourse like this here? I mean, is it really a place for this or is this a social event? I mean, what are your thoughts about just the whole uh, convention itself? Uh, I, I certainly think dialoguing is very important. Uh, I think there's a next step to it. We cannot just do it when the television cameras are around, um, when uh, big conventions uh, happen. And we have to do it ongoing um, in different areas across the country, in different communities. We need to have some town hall, heart-to-heart -heart meetings 
when everybody is, you know, on the outside who would see it is not there and really get down to the heart of what's going on. And the second thing in that is we need to allow young people to vent. One of the things I found out is when you allow young people to be heard, when you listen to them, then you have them in the palm of your hand. And once you have them in the palm of your hand, it's where the critical stage comes in. You know, what do I do next? What plan of action do I take with it? But the important thing is to get the connection with them. And the best connection is to listen. Couple more. There's a need for us to understand the various sects of, uh, of Muslims in our country and to become more uh, aware of what is there. For example, I was given this pamphlet on understanding Islam and the Muslims and, and what do Muslims believe. And if you just insert another word, you see the similarities that exist between, say, even Islam and Christianity. It says Muslims believe in one unique, incomparable God. Okay? Christians believe in that too. In the angels created by him, Christians believe that too. In the prophets for whom his revelations were brought to mankind, Christians believe that too. Uh, in the day of judgment and the individual accountability for actions. Who else believes that? In God's complete authority over human destiny and in life after death. Muslims believe in a chain of prophets starting with Adam and including Noah, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Job, Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon, Elias, Jonah, John the Baptist, and Jesus. Peace be upon them. We have not seen people like Bundy and other serial killers, Madison, and all these other. Never, never, never. Not even when there were lynchings or left and right, did any of the senators stand up and condemn a single individual as if he was speaking for an entire race. But yet they will do this again in the case of blacks. I think we need to be on serious note that all is far from being well in the United States with respect to our very parochial and indeed very dangerous attitudes towards Islam. We while Islam was the focus of this forum, another issue forum was about to commence centered around the issue of reparations, which will be the focus of a future Harambe segment. Well, the money is, is an issue. Maybe you get $20,000 before they can attract or something. That's one thing. But the fundamental is a the issue that we are the only group that subsidize the beginning of the country. One writer of the Constitution, one of the scientists from South Carolina, said South Carolina was a, was a vast wasteland of desert, unproductive except for the advantage of slave labor. It, 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 the economy could, could not have clicked because they could not have afforded it. And so the fact that we subsidized it rather than free by it is a fundamental assumption. Legislation was passed authorizing the payment of twenty thousand dollars to each Japanese American detention camp survivor. A one point five billion dollar trust fund to educate Americans about the suffering of the Japanese Americans. A formal apology from the United States government and a pardon for all those who resisted detention camps. With such presidential reparations to non-black people in four continents, it would be sheer racism for the world to discountenance reparations claims from the black world. Indeed, it is a sad, sad commentary on this issue that the United States government or any state government has not had the dignity to offer even a token of reparations to African people in America or even a formal uh, apology. The last the reason I resent this latest thing about the president about preaching us about family values because the focus must be on valued families not on family values. Family values, of course, one of the reasons why you got to talk about reparations, the ghetto itself is a manifestation of why. The ghetto is a creation of race, as in the strict covenants, the Marx was my game. The ghetto is a creature of, of capital asphyxiation. Redlining of capital by banks, insurance companies, and mortgage institutions. So it is a creature of race uh, and economics. Just making babies later will not change the structure of the ghetto deficit. We offer the Mexico an economic plan called NAP. We offer the China an economic plan called Most Favored Nations. We offer the Europe an economic plan called Defense. And then we come to Black America and say, make babies. That is an absolute insult. That alone would be inaccurate. It's also an insult. So I think, uh, in this benediction, this is the right subject. 
But I, I do think the wrong we have an obligation. I really think we have an obligation to teach it differently. I think the most black people in the real revolution now they said to become reactionary. Because this is counter all that we have been taught about who's the creditor and who's the devil. Wilson has established the value of being a creditor rather than a debtor. The debtor. It seems to me that everything else flows from that assumption. If it's a dollar involved, a hundred thousand dollars, or ten dollars, that is less the issue than who is in debt to whom. Congressman John Conyers, who chaired this forum, is the sponsor of House Bill H.R. 40, named after the 40 acres and a mule once promised to all black Americans but never fulfilled. The bill is calling for a national commission to study the issue of reparations to redress the hundreds of years of slavery. I have proposed a measure uh, that would take this out of the closet and off the dusty shelves of history and examine uh, what, if any, appropriate role uh, reparations could do in addressing the relationship between African Americans and their government uh, in this present moment. And so uh, what I've suggested that we do is create a uh, national committee of inquiry to hold hearings to examine uh, what this relationship could be in terms of reparations and to bring these uh, recommendations back to the Congress so that the Congress could then begin its debate on this matter. Uh, it's been my position that the members of the commission should, uh, first of all, be people who are knowledgeable and expert in this subject and in this history. Uh, secondly, that they uh, hold hearings across the country so that many people uh, could, could be able to input into this. Th these would be very important hearings. And then third, that they would make their own recommendations based on uh, their own knowledge and, and, and what they uh, found out and, and what they've heard and listened to and read in the course of the committee's activity. So that's uh, what we would, uh, would, would be one way of, of approaching this age-old American question that now begs to be resolved one way or the other. Congressman, what chance does H.R. 40, the reparations bill, have of it ever really coming into a debate situation? Or is Congress really the route that the proponents of reparations should be taking? The bill will, will not past this session because there are only four weeks left and a rather aggressive agenda of items. Uh, it will be, as it has been, reintroduced uh, in January, I'm sure, by Congressman Conyers of Michigan, uh, at which point we start the process again, uh, going through the respective committees, holding hearings, gathering information, hearing from both sides. Now, some people might think that that's an exercise in futility. I would just remind them that John Conyers did the same thing with the Martin Luther King Holiday Bill and he did it year after year after year. So I'm not ready to count him out yet on this. And I expect uh, that those hearings will occur sometime uh, after we get into the new Congress next year. Dr. Chavis, exactly what is the National African American Leadership Summit and exactly what are you trying to do with your organization? Well, we're trying to promote African American unity. So much of the problems that we have within the African American community throughout the United States as a result of too much division, too much disunity. If we can ever get our organizations to work together, our churches, if we can ever get our leaders to work together. And so after what I've just gone through with the NAACP, I've decided I'm going to devote my life on the question of African-American unity. Very similar to what Malcolm was attempting to do when he was killed and what Martin was attempting to do right before he was killed. So the formation of the National African-American Leadership Summit is an attempt to bring together our national African-American organizations across lines of ideology, across lines of socioeconomic circumstance, across lines of religion to promote unity. And that's what the summit does. We've had two successful summits in Baltimore. The third summit has been planned for December in Chicago. Soon we'll be in Philadelphia promoting African-American unity. Dr. Chavis, in my opinion, you were 
in the midst of bringing the, the NAACP into the 20th century, I mean, or 21st century for that matter. I mean, you were really on the move and bringing young people into the fold. Are you going to use the same strategy, the same blueprint with this organization as you were trying to do with the NAACP before you were uh, basically uh, deposed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're not going to let what happened uh, to me in the NAACP divert us off course. In fact, this may even propel us forward. Uh, the Lord moves in mysterious ways, and uh, this may be a blessing in disguise. I have to be honest with you, it was a very painful uh, situation that uh, emerged in NAACP. I had prepared to spend the rest of my life uh, helping the NAACP revitalize, reach out to young people, uh, stop the crime and violence in our community. Now I have to find another organizational framework to do that, but I'm, I remain committed. Uh, they can take away my job, but they can't take away my commitment to African Americans. What is your message to our people right now? Whatever that message might be, what is the most important thing that we need to focus on as a people? Well, I think the most important thing, there are two things. One, we need to embrace our youth. We need to raise up a new generation of freedom fighters, of justice seekers, who will not be apologetic uh, for their race or for their ethnicity or for their culture. And secondly, we need to work on our economic development. Economic inequality helps set the social conditions for crime and violence and all the other degradation that exists within our communities linked to economic development or the lack of economic development, the lack of economic empowerment. So I'm going to be promoting African-American unity. I'm going to be promoting Af African-American economic development and empowerment. And I'm certainly going to be embracing our young people, no matter where they are. In the deepest inner s sector of the hood, you're going to find us working to embrace our young people. Well, brother, let me just say this here. There are many people just like me who hold you in high esteem and feel that you are completely undaunted by this controversy. You keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you, brother. All right. Yes, sir. All right. We're wrong. Marion, what do you think the message is that is inherent in the victory, your recent victory for the mayor of Washington, D.C.? Well, there are several messages in terms of uh, our community. We have a redemptive and forgiven spirit that's followed us uh, from Africa to, to now. And secondly, uh, we are not going to just let there be several standards in our community that if you believe and redemption and redeeming forgiveness for one group of people. You got to believe in it for us. But also, people remember the entirety of Marion Barry's public service, not just one uh, 90 second, there's a minute and a half videotape, but 30 years of uh, dedicated and committed service to the people of Washington and the civil rights movement and all that came out. I think the overall message though is that if you, if you get up, you may get knocked down, but you're not knocked out. You may slip but not fall in that. Whatever your circumstance is, if you call in the God force inside of you and develop the courage and the support around you, you can get up from it. That was another message too, that you gotta just, just get up from it and, 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 and move ahead. What's going to be number one on your list of priorities? Uh, this is assuming, and we, we believe that you're going to win. Uh, assuming that you do, what's going to be the number one on your list of priorities? I got to go and work hard to get, get elected, though. I mean, I, I'm not going to take the uh, next eight weeks uh, for granted. We're going to continue to expand the political process. One thing that was so great about my election is that we brought people into it who never was involved in it. People who were just giving up and giving out about it. So we don't want to be involved. People who live in public housing, young people who say, I don't believe the system can work for me. And we, and we got them involved working and, and striving. So now we got to keep them working. And we have empowered a whole new group of people that never been empowered before. And part of my whole campaign is to keep that expansion going, bring them into the process just keep them working for the betterment of our community. And then we'll move on some practical things like the finances of our city and some other things. But the main thing is to keep the spirit of the people alive and to say to our young people, uh, there's a new day coming that uh, you can uh, come out of whatever circumstance that you're in, that I trust that uh, you know that I care and uh, that I understand your conflicts and I'll be there for you. And so that's important to our young people see that there's a new way of doing business. Brother, I'm proud of you, and good luck to you. you. All right. How would you rate the Clinton administration to date? Well, he promised an economic stimulus. He offered debt reduction and deficit. He promised an urban policy. There is no urban policy. Urban America still abandoned. Uh, we're not getting a fair return on our investment. 
oh, we need to fight welfare and crime with jobs and education. Rather, the focus is on state-of-the-art jails with second-class and substandard schools. And so there is the burden to challenge the administration to honor its covenant and to put people first. Well, let's talk about the crime bill. What's your, what's your assessment of this bill? The crime bill is a crime. It's a combination of Kool-Aid and cyanide. It will not reduce crime. And what it will do, however, is give a boom to the prison industry. The number one urban industry is jails. Number one public housing project for this administration uh, is jails. And as they privatize these jails, and sheriffs can buy stock in, in, in the public corporations, they get money according to the number of people in jail, full occupants and like hotels. This is vulgar, it's insane. Uh, we would do far better to focus on four balls in your own and three strikes and you're out. Prenatal care and head start ball one. An adequate fund of public education ball two. A marketable skill ball three and a job ball four. It's clear to me that prenatal care, head start, and daycare on the front side makes more sense and is more cost efficient than jail care and welfare on the back side. Now, when you ran for president, you had the distinction of putting drug policy and drugs as a problem on the national agenda. Now, right now, there's a 100 to 1 ratio related to sentencing of people convicted of uh, crack cocaine as opposed to powder cocaine. What is the Rainbow Coalition's position on cocaine sentencing disparity? That is why the caucus fought for a racial justice provision in the Criminal Justice Act, uh, the Criminal, the Crime Bill Act. If you're caught with five grams of crack cocaine, that's five sweet and low sugar bags, about $8 high, five years mandatory federal prison. If you're caught with 500 grams of powder cocaine, you can walk. What's the difference? The $8 high, 93% of the rest are young black males. The powder cocaine, 75% of the rest are white males. And so one goes to jail, first time offense, nonviolent offender, the other can walk. That's unfair, and it's racial, and we deserve racial justice and equal protection under the law, and we're not getting it. Recently, there was a big deal made out of the fact that you had commented, you were walking down the street, and you were relieved when you looked around, and you discovered that the gentlemen that were walking behind you were not black. And it seems to me that a lot of conservatives uh, on TV have tried to get them, gotten a lot of mileage out of that. Trying to exploit it. Uh, I live in the heart of, of the ghetto. I don't live on the fringes of town. Four people are killed on my block in a year. That killing is unacceptable. It has to stop. Young man shot to death 10 yards in front of my wife's face. A triple homicide just 30 yards down from, from my house. And so there is a fear factor. That's why people got uh, uh, houses are turned into cages. We should be able to walk our streets and sit on our porches and walk to our stores without fear of being robbed by a neighbor. We have a, the burden of, 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 of an ethical obligation. And I think one of the, the key dimensions of the Marion Barrier victory was young America uh, turning a light of hope on and hopefully a light of dope off. If we go from dope to hope, if we go from cynical withdrawal and finger pointing to using the power of our vote and our mind and our character, we in fact can make America better. Recently I watched a program that you produced on CNN where you touched on uh, the real paucity of African American representation in the media. You pointed out that your program is one of the rare situations where an African American has pretty much control of his own program. What do you comment on the state of blacks in the media? Look at the Sunday news shows, all the, the, the hosts are white. That's not America. That's culturally jaded. The Rainbow is going to have a, a conference on fairness in the media in Los Angeles, the 24th of, of September. And we're looking at the four networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, Fox, and we're going to boycott a network and use our consumer strength and our viewer strength until they, in fact, are fair in recruiting, hiring, promoting, producing, and, and on-air programming. You going to run for president again? I've not made that decision, but it is a live option. Not only does the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Legislative Conference draw who's who of African-American political leaders, it also draws many business and community activists as well. 
I'm Dr. Richard Allen Williams, and I welcome all of the folks here to be my guests at the Congressional Black Caucus. I've been coming here for 20 years, and I'm very, very enthused about what black folks can do in this age of Mary and Barry to try to pick up and do things for ourselves. That's what it's all about, it's self-help. My name is Paulette Hicks. I'm from Miami, Florida. I'm with Citibank. I'm a vice president and branch manager there. And I've come here to Washington, D.C. with the Miami-Dade Chamber of Commerce, which is our local black chamber. Me, both personally and professionally, I'm interested in small business development. So today, for example, I sat in the half-day session on minority business development and heard a fascinating panel and took a lot of notes on some wonderful ideas that I think I can take back to Miami and try and use both in the community and in my bank. Hi, I'm Tammy Longus. I'm from Detroit, Michigan. And what brings you to the legislative conference? Uh, most of all, I guess this is the only time this once a year when you can have thousands of blacks that are, 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 are basically represent the black power structure of the United States consolidated in one area. So I, I, I think this is a great opportunity to mix, mingle, and kind of like you know build relationships, find out what's going on, and, and um, you know su support one another. The growth that is here amongst African Americans and so many so many people in so many different areas, so many venues uh, that we can come together and be as one. Uh, it's, it, it's amazing that we come together for one week. I wish it was more than one week, but this is our opportunity and our chance to come together and grow as a unit. I'm Dr. Deloise Blakely and I'm the Deputy Mayor of Harlem and also the Chairperson of the Harlem Women's Committee. And the reason why I'm here at the conference is that it's very important that we have from the bottom up instead of the bottleneck from the top down. And mobilization is the most important thing. And I think this morning with Reverend Floyd Flake or Congressman Floyd Flake talking about the bones, but it's very important that we do mobilize and the youth is the future leadership of America and especially across this country, which you're talking about the urban agenda and coming from the Cairo Conference on Environment and Population with the Vice President Al Gott. And also you had the White House Conference on uh, the first White House Conference on Africa, which I attended, talking about sustainable development. And we must begin to now look at it being a prototype in urban America and how we can carry the agenda and affecting the lives of our children and youth. But women also must take the leadership at the grassroots level. So that's why I'm attending the Congressional Black Caucus. We can bring in this message and also lobbying for a very important concern, mobilization of our youth. What's your name? I'm Sheila. Sheila, it's a beautiful outfit you have. Thank you so much. Did you purchase it? Or did you I did. It? I purchased this from a woman in Silver Springs, Maryland. And she, she made it for you? Definitely. She made it. Now, what is that made of? Well, this fabric is called lioness. Lioness. Uh -huh. But these, these are symbolic lions. It's called lioness. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. Did you have a good time tonight? I had an excellent time this evening. And, and what draws you to the Congressional Black Congress? The opportunity to dialogue with people of color from all over the United States who share the same kinds of political and social agendas. From? New Jersey. New Jersey. Where are New Jersey? East Orange, New Jersey. Oh, all right. And who do we have right here? What's your name, sister? Mudiwa Kumanika. Okay. And where are you from? East Orange, New Jersey. I'm sorry? East Orange, New East Jersey. East Orange. Y'all came together? Yes. yes, we did, as a matter of fact. And what's your main reason for coming to the legislative weekend? Well, to participate in the workshops and to conversate with all of my wonderful congressmen and to see what they're going to do with us for the future. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just to show off the, the nice vines you got on tonight. Oh, no, it wasn't, but thank you so much. Well, all right. Oh. Here is one of the few times that people will come in from all over the country and it's not moaning, it's not uh, 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 sadness. This is joyous and festivity and every group of people who's struggling, struggling. This is what made Christmas so good with poor folks. You could look forward to once a year on Christmas morning, there were no poor folks. So when we come here once a year, 
Now you hear all kind of criticism about this and that and this and that. Every group of people have them a Buckingham Palace where they go and have a party. And then they go out and do the battle. The people can network here. The people can come here. They can leave. They can wheel and deal. They can hug one another. They can raise their spiritual thing. Then they can leave and go home. That's what makes it so special to me. I'm Elizabeth Johnson and I live in Washington, D.C. I also work with the children with the drug program. Yes, ma'am. This is my 24th year with the Black Caucus Without Missing. I was at the first one they had, Bill Cosby, Ozzy Davis, and a number of other celebrities. And I have the first program that they have over in the suite now that was done 24 years ago. The dress that I'm wearing now, I wore this dress 24 years ago. 24 years ago? Yes. That is absolutely gorgeous. And I have not missed one meeting that they had or one caucus for the 24 years. Is she getting married tomorrow? She getting married tomorrow? This is Debbie Smoot and I am Deborah McDaniels. Yes. And my sister Remember, is look. getting married. She's going crazy. Remember her sister? Look, it's Tony Wayne. Remember her sister? Crazy. Okay. Remember her sister? Crazy. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. Y'all ain't having a good time, are you? That's <laughs> yeah. The annual conference also featured many other events, such as a federal procurement fair catering to those business people interested in federal contracts and subcontracting. There was a tribute to the great emancipator Frederick Douglass an African-American cultural museum featuring an exhibit of an African slavery burial ground, two fabulous fashion shows, even though to attend this event is to believe that the entire fair is one of fashion, as well as a spectacular array of arts and business and culture called the Black Expo. This is where the Black Expo took place. It featured everything from representatives from car manufacturers to art and clothing vendors. You could even get a haircut if you needed one. My favorite part of the event was the absolutely beautiful Afrocentric attire and the people sporting it. I'm a freestyler. I take all the colors and I blend them into one. As you see on the wall, the yellow mud, the multicolor mud. This is what we are bought when it comes to our clothes and our accessories. Kente suits, we specialize in kente suits. Ten years ago, people never knew what kente was about. But I'm so happy and proud to see so many Africans today wear mud, kente, fatiha, you know, what we call the royal clothes. The things that we put on our back, people will never forget. It's being different, being unique, having something that everybody else don't have. This is what we're working for. This is what we're looking for. Uj, what is this that you have on right now? Describe what you have on. Well, this is called the jumpsuit. This is a yellow mud. Many people always like the jumpsuit. When they see this, they say, hey, this is royal, and we consider something like this very royal. A lot of designs today many people are using are the Hindenka symbols as well. This is called the freestyle that you're wearing now, but normally today, a lot of my family, we deal with Hindenka symbols. So to have a freestyle like you're wearing now, th this is very much impressive. This is the mud. This is the mud. Expensive? What is your taste? We have a suit like this for five seventy-five. What is your taste? We'll edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Femi Adenuga, and um, here we have I represent BB Fashions. Um, we're actually based in Maryland, Silver Spring, and all this stuff are all from Nigeria. They're out of Nigeria, and um, we have a factory back home in Nigeria where we make all these things. And um, there are lots of beautiful items. You know, now there's a lot of awareness on our African clothing you know and a lot of black americans these days are becoming more and more aware of the fashions and you know i mean different people bring different things from that i mean out of africa to america and all that but the good thing about it is that people are beginning to realize the authentic stuff and we do carry authentic things well afrocentric clothing are very expensive in the sense that i mean you have to bring them all the way from africa and then means of transportation and all that transportation is so expensive and all that but i mean they're doing quite well you know. tell us what you have on Okay, this is a four-piece agbara. It's a traditional piece, right? It's brocade. The fabric is brocade. 
and it's um, four pieces as I just said. It's one to weddings to grand occasions generally. And I mean it depends, it comes in different fabrics, you know, you can have it in plain cotton, you can have it in brocade, you can have it in print, anything you want, depending on the kind of occasion that you're going to. When you talk about the brocades and the ashoke, which is the hand woven fabric, those are for more grand occasions, they're very formal. But when you're talking about the prints, like the wax print, you're talking about like less casual, I mean less formal occasions, more casual occasions. What's your name, sister? Dr. Vanessa Weaver. And uh, where'd you get this beautiful outfit I you have on? I got this beautiful outfit from this shop right here. Okay, and uh, how would you describe this? Well, listen, it's a two-piece African pantsuit with embroidery and very uh, silver uh, beaded and woven in here and it's pinstripe and it's very elegant and extremely comfortable with the little hat that goes with it. Well, I'm all right. Because it's at a good price. Well, all right, sister, you're certainly looking absolutely Afrocentric. Okay, sir, what is your name and what is this booth all about? Well, my name is Bruce Henderson and I'm with NASA. And this is about historically black college and universities. NASA has seven HBCU research centers. Today, we're featuring Tuskegee University and their extension of Dr. George Washington and Carver's work with the sweet potato and peanut. Uh, NASA scientists have identified the sweet potato and the peanut as possible viable uh, food products in space. And so what Tuskegee has done, in addition to having several patents on their technology with hydroponics, with gro the growing of sweet potato, is now taking it to another level by trying to commercialize sweet potato products. Uh, instead of using wheat and flour, they have developed uh, flour and, and wheat-like products with the sweet potato and with the peanut. One of the unique things about the sweet potato is that every part of it is edible, so there's no waste. And that's why we're so interested uh, in using it in space. The leaves can be eaten like a collard green or a mustard green, and the roots, of course, are, are very, very tasty. And if you come over here, and uh, you can possibly taste some of the products that have been made from sweet potato. Okay. Before we do that, I want to ask you, what are some of the products that can be made from the sweet potato? Well, there are cakes, cookies, chips, uh, various forms of greens, uh, and you can see for yourself. There's a lovely display, and I hope you come into the booth and, and have a chance. NASA is very proud of the work uh, that it's done with not only Tuskegee University, but Howard University, Fisk, Clark Atlanta University, Florida A&M, Hampton, and, the other, and North Carolina A&T. Right. Get, get, get them all in, in. brother, get them all in. <laughs> now, what is your capacity with NASA? Well, I work uh, primarily with HBCUs, and my role, uh, which has been set forth by the administrator, Dan Golden, and then my immediate boss, Dr. Yvonne Freeman, has been to try to get historically black colleges and their research centers to the next level of commercialization so that they are viable and they are actually going after contracts. Well, Bruce, I want to try some of these products over here. Let, let's proceed. Okay. And uh, what is your name, ma'am, and what, is, what capacity are you in? I'm Doris Douglas. I'm a horticulture specialist, lab technician at Tuskegee University NASA Cell Center. And what I do is I help with the system, actual system, in the growth area, in which we put into hydroponics the sweet potato and the peanut. Okay, now what we got right here? Exactly what do we have here? Explain what these are. Okay, these foods are the, um, developed from the system itself, which started out as a hydroponic system to send it to space for long-term missions. The system itself was designed so that the astronauts could grow their own food while they're there for whatever it is, two years or so on. These foods were developed so that there would not be a problem with baking potatoes and pies only from the sweet potato. And that's where uh, Patricia came in in developing these products. Now, I see pasta. You can make pasta from the sweet potato? Yeah. All right, now, I, I got to try something. Now, you got to give me something to try here. Now, what you going to give me good to eat? Well, well, come on with it, sister. Come right on with it. All right. We're going to try it right now. Mm. Out of sight. Mm. Okay. I don't want to talk in my mouth over here. Mm. 
You got it is to go or what? All right. Very good. Very good. Excellent. Oh. Now it's North Las Vegas, Nevada. Vice, and I'm vice mayor, mayor from Las Vegas. Vice mayor of George Avenue. Vice, vice mayor from Las Vegas. And I'm the mayor of George Avenue. The mayor of George Avenue. I'm the mayor of George Avenue. I like it. I like it. Yeah, thank you. And I'm just big being myself, sir. Nothing personal. This is for a program called Arambe. Oh, yes, I know about it. I used to work at Temple. Oh, okay. Oh, there they go. There go those two sisters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is the, uh, the fashion show is over with? Just about. What's your name, sister? Leona. Leona. Leona what? Leona Ponzi. And where are you from? New York. New York. And what brings you to Congressional Black Power? Good time, brain trust, people, good black people. Hi, Evelyn Richardson. I'm from Queens, New York. And I'm here to bond with my brothers and sisters and see a lot of beautiful people. All right. Now, could I ask y'all a personal question? Uh-uh. Are you married? Yes, I am. Oh, forget about it, brothers. <laughs> and what about you, sister? I'm looking. You're looking. So you're down here looking. <laughs> well, I'm looking wherever I am. You look wherever you are. And what are you looking for? What, what's it take for a, for, a, for a black man in order to meet your, your standards and what you're looking for? A positive brother, someone that, who is sincere and about helping himself and others, and someone who will love me and cherish me and worship me. And I'll do the same to him. You see any prospects so far? No. <laughs> oh, please, please let me shoot, shoot you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. What's your name? Phyllis Roy. And Phyllis, where are you from? Memphis, Tennessee. Did you just come from the uh, fashion show? Yes, I did. And what did you think of it? It was just excellent. It was now, great. were you in the fashion show? No, sir, I was not. Well, you certainly look like you should be. That is an absolutely beautiful outfit. Thank you. You're precious and so kind. All right, now, did you come only for the uh, fashion show? I mean, did you come here for that? I came with the Chrysler Minority Dealers. My husband is a Chrysler dealer in Memphis, Tennessee. All right. Thank the, you. The look like you're doing quite prosperous, as a matter of fact. We like cars. You're going to ask me all that before you turn that on. <laughs> Say what, brother? You're going to ask me all these questions before you turn that on. Nah, we ain't got to ask. We ain't got to ask. I don't want to ask all of them. Well, well, you ain't got to ask. Hey, brother, kick back and threw his leg. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. Man, I'm, we just, just enjoyed the conference, and I just want to spend some time with my lady because such a lot of... Go ahead. I see you sitting real here. close to her. I'm right you? close to her, and um, <laughs> we just glad to be here, and it's so good to know you, a man with that nice camera. Well, all right. What about this distinguished looking couple right here? Where y'all from? Ivor Williams from Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama. You probably got that Alabama accent too, boy. Yes, That's sir. all right. And how many years have you been coming to Congressional Black Office? This is my third one, and it's a pleasure to come up here to meet Sharon Brown. All right. New Haven, Connecticut. That's all right. And what about your sister? I'm Sharon Brown from New Haven, Connecticut. Yeah. Very glad to be here. Very glad to see so many black people. The greatest movement in the history of this planet was the civil rights movement because we did not march on nothing but segregation. We had knocked all the segregation signs down. There's no swimming pools we can't get into. There's no toilets we can't pee at. But in the process of doing that, we bumped into something else we wasn't ready for, and that was racism. You can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't smell it. There is nobody walking around saying, I'm a racist. And so now we have to move this now from the physical to the economic and to the mental. And as we do that, and finally, I'd like to say this. I'd like for all black and oppressed people to go to a grocery store and get a toothpick. And look at that toothpick and know that toothpick started out being an oak tree. And they whittled it down. And then think about black folks. We started off being a toothpick and we're on our way to be an oak tree.